This text is Borough Genius by Victor Villaseñor. Today we are reading pages 48 through 66, which is pages 22 through 32 in a text PDF. I was five years old. The year was 1945. My father, Juan Salvador Villaseñor, walked me from our old ranch house up to the corals to talk with me. Mijito, he said, tomorrow you'll be starting school, so it's important for you to understand who you are and who your people are. You are un Mexicano, and Mexicanos are such good, strong people that everywhere, everyone wants to be a Mexican. Look at what used to happen back in the barrio in Carsbald. The gringos and the negros would come up to our pool hall, eat a few enchiladas, drink a couple of tequilas, and then they start to sing with the mariachis. That's proof that everyone loves the Mexicans and wants to be un Mexicano. Get it? I nodded. Yes, I get it, papa. Good, because now you're starting school and you have to be a good little man and start studying the girls. So when your time comes, you'll know who to choose the right wife. Because the most important thing any man can do all his life is pick the right woman to breed with. I mean, marry first, then breed. Because from the woman comes the, comes the instinct to survive, I said, having heard this for as long as I could remember. Good, said me papa, very good. And you remembered. And so for you to be attractive to girls, mijito, you can't be picking your nose anymore and wiping it off on your pants. Do you understand? Lo cortes no quita lo valiente. Y lo valiente no quita lo cortes. This I'd also heard for as long as I could remember. And it was one of our oldest Mexican dichos, sayings. And what it said was that manners didn't take away bravery. And that bravery didn't diminish manners. Yes, I said, nodding. I think I do. And also, said my dad, as he continued smoking his big, long cigar, and we passed under the huge old pepper tree. From now on, you got to be responsible, and this starts with every man and woman knowing how to wipe their own ass. I nodded again. I was listening real closely, and every word that mi papa was telling me was because growing up on a ranch with horses and cattle and big trucks and tractors, I learned that if you didn't pay it I learned if you didn't pay attention real close to what you were told, the next thing you know, you'd be run over by a tractor or be on a horseback and have your saddle slip out from under you. Or worse still, you'd have a rattlesnake scare the living shit out of you because you hadn't been paying attention to where father, son was in the sky been watching out for the shady spots on the trail. But still, I was having a hard time listening to my dad because my brain just kept jumping around inside of my head. Hell, I've never been away from mi familia before, and why did I need to go to school anyway? I was learning everything that I needed to learn there on the ranch. I knew how to milk cows to get milk. I knew to plant and grow corn so I could make tortillas. What else was there, was there for me to learn? So you understanding, mijito? My father now said to me, puffing on his cigar. You're going to have to know how to be out on your own. I shook my head. No, papá. I really don't understand, I said in Spanish. I didn't know any English. All we ever spoke on the ranch was Spanish. How can I stop picking my nose when my mocos get dry? Moco means snot in Spanish. And beginning to itch, they hurt if they don't pick them. And my ass, I never really figured out how to clean it real good yet. Do I bunch the toilet paper together, Papa? Or do I lay it on the floor and fold it real carefully so that it stays flat when I wipe myself. Who showed you to lay it out flat and fold it, I asked my father. I never thought of that. I always just bunch it together. My God, mijito, look at you. You haven't even started school yet, and you've already come up with a very good idea. I tell you, you're going to do good. You're going to do good in school. Hell, you're already thinking, and that's what education is really all about, learning how to think. Well, I felt good hearing this, but still, I didn't like the idea that I was going to have to go to school. Can I at least go to school on horseback? I now ask. I've been riding horses since I was three, and on top of the big horse, I felt like Superman, faster than a speeding bullet and stronger than a locomotive. No, I don't think so, said my dad. Why not? Uncle Archie said that when he went to school, half the kids on the reservation went on horseback, 
and they got to take their rifles too, so they could hunt for game on their way home for supper. My dad pushed my back in his Stetson and scratched his head. That was a long time ago, mijito. We can't just go riding or carrying guns into town anymore. We're civilized nowadays. I really didn't like hearing this. I figured I'd have a hell of a lot better chance at school if I could take my horse and my trusty BB gun rifle. On foot, I was still pretty damn short. And going into new territory, I found out that I had a better chance if I went on horseback and was well armed. I could hardly sleep at night. I was so nervous. I kept tossing and turning, and my older brother and sister were no help. Because I'd learned so far in life that you had to take your own lump when a horse threw you. Nothing anybody could tell you about getting bucked off could prepare you for the first time you ate dirt and felt so stunned that your brain couldn't even work until you'd taken a few breaths. But then, after eating dirt two or three times, getting bucked off wasn't all that bad anymore. I found this out firsthand. Monday morning, I got up extra early, washed and brushed my teeth, pulled up my bedding, laid out my clothes, and put on my new Levi's and a new long sleeve checkered shirt my mother had gotten for me at J.C. Penney in downtown Oceanside. I loved going to Penny's with my mother because at Penny's, they had a jar attached to a wire that they'd put your money in when you paid for something, and the jar was then pulled on a wire real fast up to a little window above the store floor. The jar would then somehow miraculously slow down just as the windowed man reached out. Took the jar, opened it, and took out your money, made your change, wrote out a receipt, and then put everything back in the jar and pulled the cord at, and the jar came flying back down on the wire as fast as a bird with his ass on fire. Also, I love pennies because like my mother Lupe always said, our pennies went further at pennies than they did at Sears. But still, Sears was where we got most of our farm and horse equipment. After breakfast, after breakfast, my mother took me into the bathroom and wiped off the egg I'd gotten on my new shirt. I could now see that my mother had been very smart in insisting that I get a checkered shirt instead of a plain blue one that I wanted because the white wet area where she cleaned on my shirt had hardly been even visible with all the checkers. When my mother was done cleaning me, she left and stayed behind in the bathroom alone. I peed in our toilet that was stained all orange from my hard, well water. Then I got up on my little box so I could see myself in the mirror over the sink, which was also stained orange. And I saw how my hair was just all about comb down, except where it always stood straight up in the back like the quills of a porcupine. Standing on the box, I made a sign of cross over myself and began talking to God. Papito, I said, you, you might have forgotten because you're so busy and all. But today I'm going to school all alone and I'm just a little kid, especially when I'm on foot. So I need for you to please stay by my side and help me out in case I do something dumb and get in trouble. Okay, do we got a deal, papito? You'll stay by my side, eh? Making my request, I now close my eyes tight like me mama grande, Doña Guadalupe, had taught me to do, so I could then hear the voice of God inside me. But what I heard next, I don't think was the voice of papito, because now I heard my mother shouting, Hurry up! You don't want to be late on your first day of school! My mother started pounding. Quickly, I made the sign of the cross once again and said, See you at school, God! and ran out of our smelly old bathroom, past the kitchen, out the back door, and out to our car. I opened the car door, pushed the chicken off the passenger seat, where she no doubt decided to nest, and my mother and I were off. With chicken's feathers flying all over us, usually my mother went to work out at the same time, but this morning she was going to drop me off at school, then go downtown to Oceanside to do her bookkeeping at our main liquor store which was located just up from the train station near the pier. I love the Oceanside Pier. This is where Uncle Archie would sometimes take me fishing. My mother drove us out from under the two huge pepper trees, passing our grouping of Torrey Pines, and drove down the long driveway of our huge Rancho Grande. Underneath the umbrella of tall eucalyptus trees, you're going to love school, said my mother. Going to school with your godmother, Manuelita, back in La Lluvia de Oro, were some of the best days of my life. But weren't you a little scared on your first day, Mama? Yes, I guess I was. But your godmother, Manuelita, was the teacher's helper, and she walked with me to school. Don't worry, she added. You'll make friends, and then with friends, school and life are much easier, mijito. I hope that my mother was right.
because living on a ranch, I didn't know any kids my own age, much less have any friends. I guess that my dog Sam had been the closest thing I'd ever had to a friend. But then he'd gotten run over by a German friend, Hans and Helen Whistler, about a year back. I was looking out our car window as we drove. I could see that there were dozens of wild ring-like pheasants in our orchards of lemons and oranges. Seeing these beautiful birds gave my heart wings. Then we passed a dark orchard of huge avocado trees with one old loquat tree with hundreds of birds like to hang out. I laughed at seeing all the birds. Up ahead, we came to California Street. This was where we had our mailbox. Here we turned right. We passed my aunt Tota's house. She was my mother's older sister and married to Uncle Archie's. Then we took a curve on the road to the left. Then a sharp right hand turn. Went past the new High Towers Market and came to Coast Highway, which was back then called Hill Street. At Hill Street, we turned right. Hill back then was the biggest, widest, longest street in all of Oceanside. In fact, Hill Street was then part of the old 101 Highway, which ran up and down the whole coast of California. Now my mother, a very good driver, speeded up and we went down a small hill over the little bridge with the inlet of seawater that went up towards our house, up a short hill, across the railroad tracks, alongside the cemetery where my mama grande, Doña Guadalupe, was buried, and then past the short street, which would later be renamed Oceanside Boulevard. Here, there were a lost track of all the streets we passed, because from here on, we were going alongside the perimeter of Big Rancho Grande, and so I didn't know my way around anymore. Suddenly, up ahead, we turned right again and climbed up a steep hill with lots of short blocks, as if we were going up to the great big Oceanside High School. And I was really glad we'd made all right-hand turns, because I didn't like left-hand turns. I remembered very well that my grandmother, when we lived in the Barrio Carsbald, had only made right-hand turns when she'd pushed me in my stroller around our block when I was little. And so, to this day, I still only felt good with right-hand turns. Then I couldn't believe it. While I was thinking of my grandmother, my mother had made a real sharp left hand turn and parked. My whole world felt like it had gotten all twisted around inside of my brain. Quickly, I flashed on my mama grande and my old dog Sam, and I just knew that I was going to need both of them, plus Papito Dios, if we were to survive the day. This is your school, said my mother to me, opening her door and getting out of our car. I didn't like the look of things. There were kids running around all over the place, and I didn't know any of them. My mother closed her door and came around the back of our car and opened the car door for me. Come on, mijito, she said. No, I said. I don't want to go, mama. But you got to, she said. Why, I said. Papa didn't go to school, and he always says that all a person has to do in this country is die and pay taxes. She laughed. Well, that's true when you grow up, mijito and go into business, but right now, you're still small, so you got to go to school before you can pay your taxes and die. Come on, she added. Give me your hand, and I'll walk you in. I still wouldn't give her my hand. Mama, I said, can you please stay with me for my first day of school? I don't know if I can do that, she said. We'll ask. Maybe I can. Then I'll just go to the store, check the cash register, and come right back. Really? Yes. Hearing this, I felt a lot better, so I took my mother's hand and got out of our car. There were kids and parents rushing by all around us. My mother squatted down on her heels of her pretty red shoes and started picking up all the white and brown chicken feathers off my shirt and hair. This is when I spotted the three huge eucalyptus trees that had stood across the street in front of the school. Two of the trees had smooth skin on their trunks, but the other one had twisted skin all about its bottom structure. I immediately liked the one with the twisted skin best. I could see that he was smiling like a huge old white elephant as he watched the kids run past him. I nodded, good morning to the huge tree, and he of course winked back at me just as mi mamá grande had always told me that trees will do when we address them with an open heart. Come on, mijito, said my mother, standing back up and closing our car door behind me. I got most of the chicken feathers off of you. I can see that we're going to have to start closing our car windows at night so the chickens don't try to nest in our car seats anymore. I nodded. 
This is something that I really liked a lot about my mother and father. They were always thinking ahead so we didn't make the same mistake twice. Making the same mistake, which I used to do when I was little, could really be painful if you kept getting knocked on your ass by life. I thank my mama for cleaning me up and she now walked me across the street. My mama looked so tall and beautiful in her new red high-heeled shoes and long, smooth, silver-gray dress. Her dress made a nice little swishing sound as she walked. She was carrying my lunch bag for me and holding my hand. The touch of her hand felt so warm and good that it made me feel good all the way up to my arm. I love me, Mama. She, too, was my everything. And just as my, as my dad's mama had been his everything, and when he'd been small, my eyes darted everywhere. I'd never seen so many kids in all my life. And almost all of them were bigger than me, and they spoke English and were laughing and having so much fun. I didn't see any kids that looked scared and were holding on to his mother's hand for dear life like I was doing. But I didn't care. I love holding hands with me, Mama. But then, getting to the big eucalyptus trees across the street, I stopped. I didn't want to go any farther. No, Mama, I said, pulling my mother down close to my face so I could whisper to her. This is a bad school. I don't want to go. But how can you know that it's a bad school, she said. You haven't even tried yet. This tree, the old wrinkled one, he told me, Mama. Trees had been speaking to me all of my life. Ever since me Mama Grande had taught me how to plant corn and listen to our vegetable garden. And old trees not only liked to talk a lot, but they were also really worth listening to. My grandmother had explained to me. Because they'd seen lots of life and so they were real smart. What did he tell you, mijito? asked my mother. He told me that bad, awful things happen in this school. And did he then tell you not to go to school? No, he didn't tell me that, mama. He said that I'm going to have to be very careful and very strong at this school. You see, mijito, then this tree isn't telling you not to go to school here. He's just telling you that you must learn to be careful and strong. Just like my mother's crying tree used to advise me back in La Lluvia de Oro during the revolution. So come on, mijito. You must be brave, and if anything really bad does happen to you, before I come back from the store, then you just run out and hug this tree, your friend, till I get back, okay? Okay, I said, feeling much better now. And I promise not to pick my nose, mama, even if my mocos get dry and itch real bad. Good. And here, take my handkerchief, said my mother. This way you can blow your nose like a gentleman, instead of picking your nose like a foolish tontito. Hearing this word, tontito, I laughed because it meant dummy, but in a very affectionate way. Taking mi mama's handkerchief, I felt so proud because I knew that mi mama grande had especially hand embroidered this handkerchief with the little red roses for my mother. Quickly, I put the handkerchief in the right back pocket of my Levi's and we now went past the three huge eucalyptus trees through the wire mesh gate that was way taller than me and up towards the building of the school itself. Inside the fence, kids were playing ball and running every which way. One boy came rushing by us so fast, chasing after a big white ball, that he bumped into me, almost knocked me down, and when he saw how I was holding on to my mother's hand, he laughed, calling me a sissy or something like that. But I didn't let go of my mother's hand, no. My dad had well explained to me that a real man didn't get offended if other men ridiculed him for staying close to women of his familia. A real hombre was proud of being close and loving with the women of his life. After asking several people questions, my mother led me down a concrete hallway that didn't have any lumps of chicken shit on it like ours at home, but towards the far building, suddenly without warning, a buzzer buzzed so loud that it scared the living hell out of me and I covered both of my ears with my hands. Now kids were running fast in all directions and parents were waving goodbye and going out of the wire mesh gates to their cars. My mother and I were just about the only people left on the playgrounds. This was the first time I heard anyone else speaking Spanish beside my mother and me. This other Mexican mother, who had three little kids with her, seemed to be even more loved than my mother and me, and asked my mother for help. My mother took her slip of paper, read it, then pointed towards the same building where we were headed. I then saw that she had a girl who was probably just about my same age, but the girl looked taller and braver than me, 
Quickly, I guessed that this was the type of girl that my dad would say I should breed with. I mean, marry first, then breed. Because you see, ever since I could remember, my dad had been telling me that any breeder of fighting bulls or fighting cocks knew that when he finally found a good bull or cock, he didn't ask who the rooster or bull were. No, he asked who was the cow or the hen, because the cows who carried their young in their bellies and the hens who knew how to build their nests and sit on their eggs have been given very special instincts by God. Women were the foundation of any home or tribe or nation, my dad always told me, so it was never too early for a boy to start studying girl, so he'd know how to choose the best wife. So I now watched this girl as she walked alongside her mother as we all walked together to the far building. She was real pretty. My mother knocked on the door. A tall woman opened the door and read over the slip of paper that my mother gave her and then indicated to me to enter the classroom and go to the rear of the room. But the room smelled funny, and all the kids in the front of the class were staring at me. I froze, refusing to let go of my mother's hand. Then the tall woman, our teacher, read the other mother's form, and gestured her daughter to also go to the rear of the classroom, where all the Mexican kids were located. And to my surprise, the tall, dark-haired girl kissed her mother and then turned and did as she was told. Seeing this, I let go of my mother's hand. I was mystified by this girl. My God, she looked so brave, just walking right down to the center aisle with all the eyes of the other students on her. Myself, I was ready to pee my pants. I was so scared. Suddenly, it entered my mind that all these girls at school had also probably been told by their parents to start looking at us boys to see who would make a good husband. If this was true, then I was sure that no girl in her right mind would ever want me as a husband, the way I was behaving. Quickly, I dried my eyes, made sure not to pick my nose, which was just itching to be picked, and I reached out with my right foot to take the first step towards the center aisle so I could go to my seat, too. But then, I didn't know why. I just panicked, jerked my foot back, said to hell with what all these girls thought about me, and grabbed hold of my mama's leg this time, not just her hand hanging on for dear life. Some of these kids started laughing. I closed my eyes so I wouldn't have to see them and started praying. God, I said, please help me to be brave and not such a coward. Then I started praying for Jesus, God's son, who had been so brave, and he hadn't even cried out when they drove these big nails into his hands. Man, I would have screamed. I asked Jesus to come and help me to be brave like him. And I was just beginning to feel better when suddenly the big tall teacher came over and grabbed me, trying to pull me loose from my mother. I shrieked at the top of my lungs, and I guess that I scared the living crap out of the teacher because she now leaped back away from me, eyes huge with shock. Regaining her composure, the teacher came at me again, and this time it became a tug of war with the teacher trying to pull me off my mother's leg. But I was strong, and it just wouldn't let go. Now the whole classroom was laughing. So finally, the teacher and my mother both took me in a hand and walked me down the center aisle and put me at my desk. But I still wouldn't let go of my mother's leg. No. I kept crying and hugging my face into me mama's dress so that no one could see the big coward I was. Mama, I said, I want you to stay. Please, I don't want to go to school here. Something bad is going to happen. Nothing bad is going to happen to you at school, mijito, said my mother. Some of my happiest memories were going to school. So now let go of me. Don't you see how nice and quiet everyone else is behaving? You can do this too, mijito. You're five years old. You're a big boy. Now please take your lunch and let go of me. Looking around, I could see that my mother was right. All these other kids my age, and they were already at their desk and not crying. My mother finally got me to let go of her, finger by finger. Then she pushed me down, telling me to stay put. She gave me my brown paper lunch bag and dropped my head, watching the back of my mother's beautiful red shoes go up the center aisle towards the front of the classroom. Stop. Talk to the teacher, who wore black shoes, and then go out the door. Seeing my mother's red shoes disappear, I almost leaped up and screaming again. But then, the boy next to me said, Calmate, in Spanish. We're going to be okay, mano. I turned and looked at this boy. My God, his Spanish sounded so soft and comforting. And he was the most darkly handsome boy that I'd ever seen. His eyes were as large and beautiful as a goat's eyes. Looking at him, I stopped crying. He was so calm and sure of himself. I wiped my eyes, rubbed my nose clean with the back of my hand, and started to wipe it off of my Levi's. But then I remembered my mother's handkerchief, 
and so I brought it out and wiped my hand. This felt good. My mama grande had done such a beautiful job when she hand embroidered this handkerchief. Looking out the window, I caught a glimpse of my mother's beautiful red hat as she walked out of the wire mesh gate and crossed the street to our car. I took a breath and put my face down into my mama's handkerchief, smelled of her fragrance, felt better and said another quick little prayer for Jesus to help me be brave, and made the sign of the cross over myself, which always felt very good to do, too. You don't have to be crying, continued saying the boy next to me in Spanish. We're together back here, and we're going to be okay. Haven't you ever been away from your mother before? Yes, but then I was always crying with me, mamá grande, or my father, or my sister and brother. Me too, he said. When I was little, but now we're all big, so we got to... This is when we heard a scream, and it was a huge, awful scream. English only, shouted our teacher at us as she came rushing down the aisle towards us Mexican kids in the back. There were about eight of us Mexican kids and three black kids in the back of the classroom. All the other students were white, and they were up front of the part of the room. You two will not be whispering back and forth between each other, telling secrets in my classroom. Do you understand me? Her face was filled with such an anger that I stopped crying. No, and I was so scared I was ready to pee in my pants. Pee pee, I said, standing up and holding my mother's hand embroidered white handkerchief as tight as I could between my legs. All the kids started laughing. There will be no bathroom till recess, she shouted. Get back in your seat, she added, grabbing me by the shoulders and shoving me back down in my seat. You've caused enough trouble for one day. There will be no more special attention given to you. Then she turned to the whole class. Is that understood? We're here to learn, and that's what we are going to do. Learn. I was sitting quietly with my eyes closed, hoping to God that no one notices I was beginning to pee. But my pee wouldn't stop, no matter how much I squeezed my legs together. At first, my underwear and handkerchief soaked up most of the pee, so I hoped to God that maybe this would be the end of it. But then, to my surprise, the pee just kept coming and coming and began working its way down the seat of my pants, feeling real warm as it formed a puddle of urine under me on the seat of my desk. Then, incredibly, the pee still wouldn't stop and continued coming in a steady flow, and now I could feel that it was going to start dripping off the sides of my seat. And if it did this, I just knew that everyone around me would start hearing the drip-dropping sound of my pee as it hit the floor like rain coming off the roof of a house. I pulled my butt forward through the warm puddle of urine in my seat so that I could maybe get my urine to slide forward and run down the inside of my new Levi's. And thank God it worked. I pulled my butt forward through the puddle of urine and now I could feel most of my pee running down the inside of my Levi's and going into my boots, warming my feet. But I had no control of the smell. And soon, the smell was beginning to cause the people closest to me to sniff the air and look towards me. This is when I saw the tall girl who walked so bravely down to the center aisle turn and give me a pure look of disgust. I began to cry. I just couldn't help it. I, it was only my first day at school and I had already failed. No girl in her right mind would now ever want me for a husband. I was a coward. And cowards were no good for nothing. Ever. But then, I saw that one good thing about only having Mexicanos all around me was that none of them said a word. So the rest of the classroom never knew about my moment of terrible shame. By the time recess was called, I didn't have to pee anymore. But still, I went to the bathroom, got in a stall, took off my Levi's, slipped off my underwear, and threw them in my mother's handkerchief into the toilet. But they wouldn't flush down no matter how much I tried. Then, the horror of horrors, the toilet began to overflow. Oh my god, I said. Why are you letting all these terrible things happen to me, papito? Eh? Is it that I did something wrong? Or are you just so busy doing big, important stuff that you forgot we had a deal and you were going to stay close to me today? I quickly put my wet Levi's back on, finished my mother's white handkerchief out of the toilet, and ran out to the restroom so that no one would know that I ruined the bathroom, with the toilet now overflowing all over the place. Outside, I tried to squeeze all the urine and toilet water out of my mother's handkerchief. My heart was beat and beat and beating a million miles an hour. Then I noticed the tall, old, wrinkled eucalyptus tree was right there by my side, just outside of our playground, and he was smiling at me. Be brave, he said to me in a soft, kind tone of voice. Be brave. And saying this, his limbs took on a wind, and all his leaves began to sing and dance. I took a deep breath. I didn't know what to do. 
but he was being so kind and beautiful that I suddenly felt a lot less scared. I glanced around and saw that all the other Mex Mexican kids of my classroom were at the far end of the playground. Go to them, said the huge old tree, winking at me. And always remember that what your mother told you. The school and life are much easier when we have friends. See, myself, I'm not alone. I have two good friends growing alongside of me. And it was true. The old wrinkled tree had two smooth bark trees growing right alongside of him. And they too were now dancing and smiling at me with the wind rustling through their leaves. I felt a whole lot better. Thank you, I said to all the trees, and then turned and started across the playground. The darkly handsome boy's name was Ramon, and he was the one who was doing most of the talking when I came up. None of the other kids paid any attention to me. Who could blame them? I was the biggest crybaby of the lot. What are we going to do, I asked one boy. I don't know, said Ramon. But one of the things for certain, they're treating us like we're a bunch of pendejos. Pendejo was a very strong word in Spanish that meant stupid ass. It really had even more science and chile to it than that. We all quickly agreed with Mar Ramon's assessment of the situation and were now voicing our own opinions and just beginning to feel better among ourselves when suddenly, out of nowhere, a huge muscular woman teacher who had the voice like a man rushed in on us. No Spanish, she bellowed. You were all told that in your classroom. There will be only English spoken on the school grounds. Do you boys understand me? Pee-pee, I said under my breath, wondering if Pee-pee was Spanish or English. And once more, I squeaked my legs together real tight, hoping to God I wouldn't pee again. To my huge surprise, as the rest of us all went silent with beer, Ramon went right into talking Spanish in a calm tone of voice, saying, They're not our parents. They have no right to be yelling at us, especially when we're out here by ourselves. I told you! No Spanish, yelled the teacher, grabbing Ramon by his shoulders and shaking him. Oye, you're not my mother, shouted Ramon at the huge teacher. Let go of me. You have no right of grabbing me. But she didn't let go. She now grabbed on by his hair, shaking him all the more. No Spanish, I said, she bellowed. You hear me? No Spanish. La tuya, vieja pinche mala, shouted Ramon. What did you say, yelled the teacher? Don't think I don't know your dirty, spicy words. And she slapped him across the face once, twice, three times. But still, Ramon continued to speak Spanish, telling us not to fear that we were Mexicanos and that we weren't their slaves. I quit crying, just like that. My God, I couldn't believe it. This boy Ramon had to be the bravest human being I've ever seen. And the huge teacher, she just kept right on slapping him until his face was covered with blood. I dried my eyes and thought of the pictures of our good Lord Jesus on the walls of our church when he carried the cross on his back to Calvary. Quickly, I made sign of the cross over myself, and I was saying a quick prayer when the buzz buzzed, and she finally stopped hitting Ramon. And my God, Ramon was just a little five-year-old kid like the rest of us. She dragged him off towards the bathroom. The rest of you dirty little spicks get to your classroom right now, while I wash this little warped mouth with soap. Another teacher, a man, came up, but he didn't yell at us. He'd seen what had happened, and he had very nicely escorted us back to our classroom. I'd been right when I told my mother that something bad was going to happen at the school. My mother had been gone less than an hour, and already things were going so bad, it seemed to me like it was the end of the world. That day, my mother never came for me until the end of school, and when I saw her, I got real mad and yelled at her. Mama, I shouted. Why don't you come back to stay with me like you said that you would? I did come back, she said, but the school authorities told me that parents weren't allowed on the school grounds unless it's an emergency. Then she asked me if I was okay. I shrugged. I didn't know what to say. Compared to Ramon, I guessed that I was okay. And at home, that afternoon, I tried to wash my own Levi's and my mother's handkerchief so no one would know my terrible shame. Then at dinner, when my father asked me how my first day of school had gone, I didn't know what to say to him either, because I didn't want my dad finding out that his son was a crybaby coward, and that he'd been a fool to have ever told me that everyone loved Mexicans, because they didn't. Our teachers hated us Mex Mexican kids. So all I said was, okay, fine, Papa. And I said nothing more that day, and I didn't say anything the next day either, or the day after that. And each day, things at school got meaner and more terrifying than the day before. They were crucifying Ramon. They were really hitting him and hurting him because he was the only kid among us who wouldn't break. Finally, 
By the end of my first week of school, I was having a nightmares almost every night and wetting myself into my sleep too. And I'd never been a bedwetter before. I just couldn't help it. All night long in my dreams, tall, huge teachers kept chasing us Mexican kids. And they had big, sharp teeth like a dog's. And we kids had to keep running or we were going to get eaten alive if they spoke any Spanish. And sometimes, my God, Spanish would just slip out of our mouths. School became a living hell. And at home, I no longer wanted to listen to my father's stories around the dinner table about how great we Los Mexicanos were. My dad was a stupid fool. He had no idea what the hell he was talking about.